Well, chapter one, two more pages, three more pages. Yep. Okay, is my dad, uh, was my granddad a communist? No, anti-fascist. I'm trying to understand his perspective by reading his books. The social ideal of contemporary democracy. So this was the state and rule of law in a mixed economy published by uh, in 1970, uh, based on his lectures at Calcutta University. Okay, the social ideal of contemporary democracy. Since any legal order reflects on the social ideals of the society that it seeks to order, we must first ask whether we can formulate, even in the broadest terms, a common social ideal of contemporary democracy, an ideal that would be applicable to the United States as well as India, to the Netherlands, as well as West Germany or, or Australia. The common characteristic of these countries is that they do not believe in absolute state power expressing itself in a totally centralised and planned economy and that they seek to maintain a balance of economic forces in which no single economic group can totally dominate all others and where the individual citizen is not merely a helpless victim of economic forces that he is powerless to control or influence. It is easy to give a first broad answer that it is impossible under contemporary conditions to obtain such a social condition by the economic philosophy of laissez-faire. The belief which still dominated Bentham's utilitarian philosophy, i.e. that once an equal start, that once an equal start was provided for all, the free play of economic forces would produce the best of all possible societies, is dead and buried. Yet it found powerful expression in the American economic and legal philosophy, particularly of the second half of the 19th century, when in decision after decision, the Supreme Court of the United States interpreted the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments to the Constitution as forbidding any interference by social legislation with freedom of contract as an un unconstitutional violation of due process in the taking of property. To take but one classical example, as late as 1904, a New York law limiting employment in bakeries to uh, a new law New York law limiting employment in bakeries to ten hours per day was held invalid as depriving an employer of liberty without due process of law. In his celebrated dissent, Holmes observed that the Fourteenth Amendment does not enact Mr. Herbert Spencer's social statics. Holmes showed that even at the time at that time the law could not but interfere in a hundred ways with liberty could not but interfere in a hundred ways with liberty of contract and other supposed freedoms of the citizen. Cit Laissez-faire in the United States was finally buried by the massive body of social legislation passed after the Great Depression of the 1930s in the era of the New Deal. Federal and state social legislation providing for unemployment, insurance, social security and many other aspects of minimal, minimum welfare was supplemented by the acknowledgement of an active role of the state in guiding, in guiding and regulating the state of employment and business in the nation. Budgetary policy has long been accepted as an instrument of steering of the, uh, the economy it is unnecessary, unnecessary to dwell at any length at this stage on the many aspects of the evolution of the United States from a laissez-faire economy to a social welfare state. The story has been told often enough. This philosophy which belatedly accepted by, sorry, this philosophy which was belatedly accepted by the most powerful bastion of laissez-faire was adopted much earlier in the rest of the Western world. The social insurance legislation sponsored by Bismarck in the 1980s in Germany, the social security system first introduced by the Liberal government of 1906 and culminating after World War II in the national insurance legislation of Britain, or the, or the much more comprehensive social welfare legislation of the Scandinavian states, which as in Britain includes the National Health Service, are familiar illustrations. The later evolution of this acknowledgement of public responsibility for minimum social welfare is the legislation proposed is the legislation proposed by the Nixon administration in, in 1970 with widespread support of economists who have been lifelong enemies of socialism. The, the gist of this new scheme is the provision of a minimum 
standard of living for all coupled with a progressive reduction of their benefits for earning exceeding this guaranteed minimum income. The idea that the state should provide a minimum income for all regardless of work, whether by negative income tax, by family allowances or by any other method would have shocked not only the followers of Bentham or Adam Smith, but the great majority of economists of a generation ago. In Great Britain a few years ago, a leading critic of state socialism suggested that the best way for the community to tackle the problem of poverty would be by guaranteeing everybody a minimum through the use of a negative income tax or other device. The philosophy of the free play of economic forces is thus no longer accepted by any contemporary democracy. The right of every citizen to a minimum standard of living as a condition of liberty and human dignity is universally accepted even though the implementation of this ideal is, uh, still lags far behind the aspiration. This means the acknowledgement of the positive role of the state and the use of law for the attainment of certain economic and social ends. Beyond this generally accepted minimum, minimum there remain vast divergencies, not only on the scope of this deliberate correction of the free play of economic forces, but on the instrumentalities. We will now turn to the analysis of the four major activities of government outlined at the outset of these lectures. But the state as a provider and controller.